Hi, my name is Taylor Hughes, and I'm at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And today I'm here to talk to you about weak topological phases, including weak topological insulators and weak topological superconductors. Let's begin with the name, weak topological phase. So where does the name come from? Well, we say weak because it's a comparison to a different class of topological phases called strong topological insulators and superconductors. In fact, we've been studying strong topological insulators and superconductors the entire time so far in this course. Things like the Kataev P-wave wire, the Chern insulator, the quantum spin Hall effect, and the three-dimensional time-reversal invariant topological insulator are all examples of strong topological phases, and they earn this name strong because they are robust even in the presence of strong disorder. On the other hand, weak topological insulators uh, not only require some discrete symmetries to be protected and robust, they may also require to be protected by the inclusion of discrete translation symmetries on the lattice. So this distinction is that weak topological phases require extra symmetry, namely discrete translation symmetry, in order to be robust topological phases of matter. Now, the sensitivity to translation symmetry is not all bad, because even though the system now is more sensitive and more fragile in the presence of disorder, at least that's what's expected, the system now develops a sensitivity to translation symmetry defects called dislocations. We will see in a moment that dislocations can now trap topological bound states and harbor interesting uh, features, uh, and that's because of the sensitivity to translation symmetry. In fact, it's quite often the case that when a topological phase is protected by some global symmetry, defects, which are fluxes of that symmetry, uh, can harbor interesting properties. And so today we're going to talk about weak topological states and their sensitivity to dislocations. Okay, so now we're ready to talk about how we might construct a weak topological phase. We do this by beginning with a strong topological phase. In this case, I've chosen the one-dimensional Kataev P-wave wire, which is a one-dimensional topological superconductor. We can take this system and stack it up into two dimensions, and now we've created a two-dimensional weak topological superconductor. This system still has edge states, just like the two-dimensional strong topological superconductor, but in this case, the edge states are anisotropic. They only exist on a pair of edges, not on all edges. So in this case, we have edge states, low energy modes, on the left and right edges, but not on the top and bottom. We can now imagine taking these planes and then stacking them up into 3D. And now we have a quasi-one-dimensional, three-dimensional layered system, which is a three-dimensional weak topological phase. This system also has now surface states, but it only has surface states on the left and right surfaces, not on the front or back or top or bottom. Now, these are named as follows. On the left half, we have a system where we stacked up one-dimensional wires into 2D. Since we went up only one dimension, these are called primary weak topological phases. On the right side, we took one-dimensional wires and stacked them up two dimensions higher to 3D. These are called secondary weak topological phases. Now, there's something else interesting here. We could have stacked the wires in different directions. We could have stacked them, say, vertically or horizontally. And this shows, again, the anisotropy. These systems both have edge states, but they're on different sets of edges in this case. On the left half, where I've stacked the wires up vertically, only the left and right edges have low energy bound states. And on the right side, when I've stacked, stacked the wires horizontally, only the top and bottom, the up and down parts, have um, uh, low energy bound states. This also indicates that the topological invariant that's going to describe these systems, which is called a weak index, will be anisotropic. And in this case, instead of being a scalar, it will be a vector quantity, which tells us exactly how the 1D wires are stacked up into two dimensions. Now we can play this game with any type of strong topological phase. For example, some examples we studied so far in the course, we've looked at the chiral superconductor, the Chern insulator, the quantum spin Hall insulator, and we can imagine taking a plane of these and then stacking them up. In this case, I've chosen a single plane of a Chern insulator, and I've stacked it up into three dimensions, which I now create a 3D primary topological insulator because I've stacked up two dimensional planes into one higher dimension. This system will have edge states on the left and right edges, but not on the very top and the very bottom, again showing the anisotropy. This system is again described by a vector weak index because it's a primary topological phase, and the vector tells me which direction these planes are stacked. Let's look at this a little bit more systematically. Suppose we imagine we're taking the classes of time reversal breaking superconductors. Now, in one plus one dimensions, uh, this represents the Kataev P wave wire and has a Z2 topological invariant. In two plus one dimensions, this represents a chiral topological superconductor, which has an integer invariant, which is called the turn, turn, in, turn number, which is very similar to the classification for turn insulators, only in this case it's a superconductor, not an insulator. It turns out that time reversal breaking superconductors in 3 plus 1D have no interesting topological invariants, at least without extra, adding extra symmetries. If we now add 
the restriction that our system has to have discrete lattice translation symmetry in all directions, this increases the classification. It augments it by extra topological invariance. So in two dimensions, for example, we now have the strong index given by the z, and we have two weak indices here, which are a vector of z2 invariance, which tells how we stack the 1D strong topological phases into 2D. In 3D, it has no strong invariant, but it has three primary weak indices given by these integers, which tells us how we stack up planes of 2 plus 1D systems into 3D. There's three different ways we can stack up planes, or how we stack up wires into 3D. And it turns out there's three different ways we can stack up wires into 3D. So this green index here labels the uh, secondary weak topological invariant. Now the strong invariants here are given by scalars, which I believe by G. And so in 1D and 2D, we have scalar invariants. The primary weak invariants are given by vectors, which are given by this label G with an index A, which is the vector index labeling the components. And the secondary weak invariant is actually an anti-symmetric tensor. Now in three dimensions, an anti-symmetric tensor can also be written as a vector. And so in this case, there's no use of distinguishing this anti-symmetric tensor from just a second vector. And it tells us sort of which way the wires are pointing if we stack them to 3D. Now, the strong invariants we see are isotropic, whereas the weak invariants, since they have a direction, a vector, for example, they point, they're anisotropic. In the first place, weak topological states appeared was actually in the context of strong topological insulators and weak topological insulators with time reversal symmetry in three dimensions. And this first appeared in the work of Foucault, Mali, Moore and Balance, and Roy in 2007. Now, let's look at the different examples here. So, for example, here we have strong, weak, and secondary weak. The strong examples are a Katai of P-wave wire or the churn insulator. I can stack these up to get primary weak invariants, so I stack up wires to get a two-dimensional weak state, or I stack up planes to get a three-dimensional weak state, which is a primary state. Or I can stack up wires to get a three-dimensional state, which is the secondary weak invariant. This sort of summarizes our understanding of these weak topological phases. Now, if you're more mathematically inclined, this extra, these extra topological invariants come from describing momentum space in terms of a torus instead of a sphere. Now, a torus has extra lower dimensional topology compared to a sphere of the same dimension, and this gives rise to these extra topological invariants. So let me now briefly motivate why translation symmetry is important for protecting these weak topological phases. The easiest way to know how to do this is to study the properties of the edge states when we break translation symmetry by adding a staggered potential or some kind of staggered perturbation to the boundary, which will break translation symmetry by a factor of two. It basically dimerizes the edge. So in this case, I've shown a strong topological system for comparison with the chiral edge states. If I look at the edge state dispersion in the edge Brillouin zone, I see I get a single monotonically increasing dispersive branch in this case, which, has a, which is a chiral edge mode. If I now add a staggered potential to the edge, then what will happen is I should fold the Brillouin zone in half. When I fold the Brillouin zone in half, we can see that I still generate a single chiral branch at every energy. And in fact, I cannot destabilize this edge state by adding any perturbations, and so I have a robust chiral phase even if I break translation symmetry on the edge. If instead I take a weak topological state, and to make the picture clear, I add some tunneling between each wire, I will now generate this type of edge state. This red line here, which traverses the entire Brillouin zone, is the new edge state. It crosses zero energy, not only at k equals zero in the edge Brillouin zone, but also at k equals pi. The fact that the edge states, or in higher dimensional cases, the surface states, cross pi, or a, another time reversal invariant momentum in the Brillouin zone, is a generic feature of a system with a non-trivial weak index. Now, in this case, if I add a staggered potential to the boundary, or some kind of dimerization pattern, what will happen is when I fold the Brillouin zone, I will now get a degeneracy, a crossing point between the edge branches which have been folded. And now any perturbation will naturally lift its degeneracy and I can open a gap for the edge states. If I can open a gap in the edge states, that means I can now find a gapped real space interpolation between my putative topological weak phase and the vacuum outside. And because I have this gapped adiabatic interpolation, it means we should think about these two phases as being equivalent and not distinguished by a non-trivial topological invariant. This is exactly why translation symmetry is important. It means that if only the weak invariant is non-zero, then breaking translation symmetry, even just on the edge, allows us to gap the system entirely and enables it to make it adiabatically connected to the vacuum. Okay, now that we've completed all the background, we're now ready to discuss why weak topological systems are sensitive to translation defects called dislocations. Let's briefly review the idea of a dislocation. In this picture, I've drawn a quasi-one-dimensional lattice of atoms, and I've drawn two different edge dislocations indicated by these two colored circles. Now, an edge dislocation is generated 
if I jam in an extra partial line of atoms into this lattice. I, here I've put them in vertically. Uh, I could have also put them in horizontally. And so they, the orientation uh, could change. Now let's actually look at the characteristic property of a dislocation. First, let's take a closed path in the reference lattice. So basically far away from any dislocation. This closed path now I have is specified by taking three steps right, three up, three left, and three down, starting from a common point. And if I do this path, it's closed because I end up back where I started. If I take the exact same path by going three right, three up, three left, three down, but in closing a dislocation, I do not end up back where I started. And in fact, I end up translated. And the amount of translation uh, which differs from the original position is called the Burgers vector of the dislocation. The Burgers vector is an intrinsic property of the dislocation. It does not change if I locally deform the core of the dislocation. And in fact, it must be equal to some lattice vector. And with this Burgers vector is what we would call the topological flux associated to each dislocation. And it must be a lattice vector. A analogy between the dislocation and a, the aronoff bohm effect for magnetic flux is very nice to see. So imagine here I have an isolated magnetic flux line and I have a charged electron, which I'm going to subsequently take around this flux line. So now I've taken my electron and I've dragged it around this isolated magnetic flux. The wave function of the electron picks up a phase called the aronoff bohm phase. The aronoff bohm phase tells us that a charged particle will pick up a phase proportional to the charge times the magnetic flux divided by h bar. If this was an isolated dislocation uh, instead of a flux line, instead of picking up a U1 phase, what we'd pick up is a translation operator. And the amount of translation is the Burgers vector times the momentum, the momentum operator in this case, which is the generator of translations. So in this system now, the phase we pick up is actually a translation phase and is proportional to the momentum of the state and the Burgers vector of the dislocation. Now let's see why weak topological insulators have this nice interplay with dislocations. Imagine I stack up planes of some strong topological phase and I jam in an extra half plane of this topological state. And this extra half plane represents an edge dislocation. The Burgers vector of this edge dislocation is in the z direction. The stacking vector of the planes is also in the z direction, so they're parallel. And we can see just from this decoupled picture that this extra half plane will actually harbor low energy bound states, the same type of low energy bound states that would exist on the full edge of a single plane. We can do the same thing in lower dimensions. So imagine now I have these lines of Kataev P wave wires, which are topological, and I've stacked them up. If I now jam in an extra partial wire, then on the end of it, it will contain a topological bound state, the same topological bound state which occurs on the natural boundary of these type of wires, namely a single Majorana mode. It turns out that the orientation of the stacking vector and the Burgers vector is important. So for example, if I keep the Burgers vector the, the same, so basically I have this edge dislocation here, but I reorient the stacking vector, in this case we generate no topological bound state. There's an index that was predicted by Yingran, Yizang, and Ashwin Vishwanath in 2009 in the Nature Physics paper, which tells us that the dot product between the weak topological index G and the Burgers vector dislocation must be non-zero in order to harbor topological bound states. And so the nice thing is that even though I've drawn these weak topological phases as decoupled wires and decoupled planes, this topological bound state remains localized and robust even if we couple the wires and planes. This is sort of the generic topological feature of a weak topological phase. Well, that completes the basic introduction to weak topological phases and dislocation bound states. We'll come back in a little while to discuss open problems and exciting new directions in this field.